as a child, I grew up in the beginning of the space age and I was very much a child of the space age. My great love in life, my fascination was to do with space, astronomy, science, and as I grew, physics and cosmology. I didn't expect to become an artist. I wasn't planning on it. My life was changed in a single day, a day when I went to see a great exhibition of kinetic art. That exhibition was way back, 1970, at the Hayward Gallery in London, and at the time I was a student studying physics and mathematics. Many years later, I had the good fortune to bump into not one of the artists from that exhibition, sadly they're all gone I fear from now, but one of the widows of what, of what I thought was the, perhaps the greatest artist of all from that early exhibition, Nicholas Schofer. And the first few slides I'm going to show you are slides of the studio that his, what his widow still lives in and where she keeps this collection. Let me a moment. Right. A collection of his pieces. Looking back at them now, they look to me a little primitive, I have to admit. Slightly mechanical. But for Nicholas and for my youthful eyes, nearly 40 years ago, these very much expressed the, the future. He described himself as a cybernetic artist, and his vision was to combine computing with art. But he had this vision. or maybe banks as well, I guess. And so all these machines are actually built using simple mechanical and electrical mechanical devices. Lights, but they were just lights. They were not video projectors and lasers and all the things that came later. But still it was incredibly inspiring. And overnight it changed me from a man who was just going to carry on with his career in physics. I didn't drop out, but I began to work in two paths at once. I began as a hobby, as it were, to start with, to explore and experiment with light. And this machine here was a, a third year project I did still as a physics student, but it was a, a light machine. <coughs> the purpose of the machine was to demonstrate wave motion. There was a ripple tank down below. Just think switch this gadget on. This was a fluid, a collection of sensors and then a collection of lamps. The idea being to transform the ripples in the ripple tank into a pattern of lights that came on and off. It worked, not very well, but it worked. <laughs> this is my first perhaps ever experiment in light. Certainly the first I've managed to record and find a document of. I have been searching through and I've tried to find as many old pictures as I could find, but a lot has been lost from this very early age. I made light shows. Uh, and this is, I think, perhaps not the only one, but almost the only image from that era. And I started to experiment with kinetics. And one of the first things that fascinated me, I called the magic fountain. These are little tiny granules being blown on jets of air. Now that's me, aged about 20 or 21, I guess. <laughs> and pretty soon I started to make these quite large. The interest in scaling up began and another one of my magic fountains. After I finished my physics degree, I decided I'd better start again, as it were, and I went and did another degree in art. And while I was at art college, I really concentrated on trying to invent and explore new media. Again, this was in an age when there was now just beginning to be the first hints of a, a media available in a standard form. The first black and white video had arrived. There were synthesizers for people exploring sound. But I was not impressed with the technology that was available at that time. And so I decided I had to invent my new media entirely from scratch. This is an example of an ex early experiment, an experiment with light. And the light is grazing across the surface. And you may recognize this is a little bit like one of the pieces in the exhibition we've just been to visit. And this piece I've recreated in a sense that was one of the first pieces that I thought about when I was invited to come and make the exhibition here was I thought I would like to start at the beginning and show how by using simple optical techniques 
in this case, elements that show how light is refracted, how it's reflected, how it's transformed by optical media. Here, another picture. But you've already seen, I think, the piece in the great museum next door. Here's another experiment never pursued again. These are hot wires, the kind of wires you normally use in a, a heating device, such as you know, a toaster to toast your t bread. But I made them into sculptures. They all need mains electricity, so it's a little bit dangerous, this form of uh, sculpture. <laughs> and also auto-destructive, because I would build one for an evening performance, we would switch it on, we would turn the power up, and the sculptures would gradually change shape and, and collapse down, and after a while begin to short circuit, and there will be some sparks, and then that will be the end of the show. <laughs> I also began to experiment with painting. Abstract expressionism, I guess, was my influence. I painted on glass. And here we see one or two of my, my glass paintings. And I began to explore light, light just for its own sake, because I'm sure this was the greatest influence of all. I began to play around with lenses, prisms, and make things happen. I wish I had more records of this. This material currently is completely lost, but I imagine one day I may try and recreate some of these very early experiments with light. At the moment, we just have a few slides to remind me and show you a little bit of what was there. And also with vibrations. These became the two things that were most important to me, the, the, the light and the vibrations, the waveforms. And pretty soon I invented this form of light, which you've already seen but maybe not understood, with two of the pieces over there. The one that's called the wave function, which is a, in fact only a single string that's dancing before your eyes, but is being illuminated with special light. Here is a collection of little tiny black and white structures. These are only, well, these are, these are toy model motors here. This is just, you know, maybe altogether not more than 30, 40 centimeters high, very crudely made. Now when you switch these on and begin to rotate them with their little motors, because they're being lit with the chromostrobic light, these mysterious colors appear. The way it works is that the light is being modulated at a high frequency and it's changing color faster than the human eye can see. I do this in a simple way again. There's a disc in front of the light source being rotated rapidly. As long as it goes fast enough, at most you see only a slight flicker coming from the light, but you cannot distinguish the colors. But when the light falls on something which is also moving fast, you can achieve a synchronization or some kind of relationship between the changing colors in the light and the spinning forms. So this then are uh, sculptures which I would say have been created partly by playing with human perception, because it's only the way our eyes work that make us see these forms transformed like that. This is a simple hoop being spun round to create this ball shape. And here's an exa early example of experimenting with the vibrating strings. The string is just one string, because if when you've seen the sculpture in the Rene Sophia, you may get the impression there are many strings, but there's not. There's just one string, and the string is being spun fast enough that it's impossible to see the string. You see instead this, this volume that it spans. And it's not a simple resonant form like harmonics, because something else comes into play, <laughs> chaos theory. And this was for me a great and wonderful cybernetic discovery, uh, serendipitous discovery, I beg your pardon. I didn't know this was going to happen before I spun the string. I thought I would see harmonic forms, but what happened instead was something far more complex. I will return to this later in the talk. I also started to make designs for theatre. This is an early design I created while still a student at art college. 
and it was for a local college, also very, very you know, amateur, quite unprofessional, just experimenting. The story was monkey. I don't know if you know the Chinese myth monkey, but we tried to bring it up to date and create a, a, a surreal version of the monkey mythology. Later I began to work as a stage lighting designer, specifically with avant-garde musicians. I became interested in this because I like their quality of abstraction. They didn't have a story to tell at all. They simply wanted to find a way to give an atmosphere to present their, their music, very abstract music normally. And I designed a series of concerts in and around London and some outside London around England, starting from the early 80s. These, this is at the Almeida Theatre, which is a, a well-known location in London. I don't remember where that one is. This is now at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall on the South Bank. There's a much larger, and by now I'm beginning to work on a more professional scale. And this was a group called Man Jumping, who had produced a uh, sound, I would say, was really like jazz, but they tried to make their jazz as not a typical entertainment jazz, but with something more experimental about it. And then after that, I met a man who was, had a symphony orchestra, and his dream was to combine classical and avant-garde together and to present it in a very modern way the Electric Symphony Orchestra. Here we are, the entire orchestra, all surrounded by light shows. And that, to add an extra strange feature, they all have these very strange chairs they sit on as well. Instead of being sitting on conventional chairs, they're, they're perched as on stools. And with every feature of the stage design, we try to give it a, a distinctive modern character. And then we return to the vibrating waveforms because I was getting frustrated with working only in public in stage design and I started to focus my attention more on my art and my light sculpture. And I realized that really working in the stage was an interesting experience and it was a good training, but what I really wanted to do more than anything was just to be an, a light artist. And from, I think we're going to see now that for many years, these waveforms that I create with the vibrations of the string became absolutely central to everything I've done. So this was starting in around 1988. I abandoned the stage lighting. And really, since about that time, 20 years ago, I would describe myself as becoming a full-time artist. I made a small version of the string sculpture that went on to be mass-produced and was sold for a short while as you know, a, a little item you could buy on, uh, in a gift shop. But I'm quite glad I didn't commercialize it more and that I stuck with the purity of art. These, again, are very, very small. These little displays are very small at this stage. And then they begin to grow. This one's about a meter high, this group of three here. And gradually, I'm finding myself tempted to make things bigger and bigger. These are photographs from an exhibition I did in Canada. Uh, not quite the first time I was abroad. I had shown outside the UK several times before. But the first time we did a really big show. And that, that's me again from about uh, 1990. I can't remember exactly which 90. 93, maybe. And as you can see by now, the sculptures have grown quite large. And this is a piece I created for the first time for a prestigious client. This is the headquarters of BT, the uh, telecoms giant in Britain. And that, in the background there, is uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. Their head office is just across the way from St. Paul's. So I found myself in a, a very uh, beautiful location 
In fact, I think coming back to the Renaissance, coming to the Renaissance is the first time I've felt a game. I'm in such a hallowed surroundings. <laughs> And now here's a piece I did in New York in 1998. That's about eight meters tall and was uh, exhibited at the New York Hall of Science. I, I, I think it was a wonderful location because this old building had originally been built uh, for uh, the trade fair in 1964. And they designed this room to create an atmosphere like outer space. That was the intention. It was the American uh, plan to how to get to the moon even before they knew how they would do it. They created a, a fantasy mock-up of how they were going to do it and later this room was saved and became an exhibition hall. So walking into this space I thought, ah, now this is somewhere I'm going to really enjoy being able to work. Um, for me it was probably the first time I did a really great, very, very special piece. The piece is interactive and the child there she is standing underneath a, a sensor which detects her movement. So as she waves her hands, the waveform will react to her movements. And you see more and more I'm working with these waves. This is now in London again. And now here's another big piece from Manchester. Now the interesting thing about these waves is, as I said, I expected when I first created waves that they would be harmonic. But that's not exactly what happens. There is a relationship between the traditional sounds and the harmonies that we know about, and these forms that are not something that's part of sound, but as part of chaos theory. But you still see it return very often to the more harmonic form. So there's an interplay between these two kind of qualities that nature puts its energy into. Sometimes it's harmonic, sometimes it's chaotic, and sometimes they are blending together. So that is almost returning to the kind of classical symmetries we associate with harmony. And this is the first time I showed in Spain. This is a very small show I did in Barcelona in 2000. And uh, it was Okay, already in a very lovely place, a little chapel that had been converted to a gallery, somewhere just 100 meters from La Rambla's. And I shared the space with other video artists. And this one now in Paris, in a big art center in the outskirts of Paris, the Maison des Arts Clote. And now back again in Barcelona. This was for Art Futura. And now this piece is in Berlin. And this one, I discovered that the spinning waveform could be held from the top only. And it was a very, very high room. It was something like 12 meters, the top point. But the bottom end of it could be free, just to dance around in open space. And on the opening night, shortly after the sculpture had been opened to the public, I was sitting there watching, and suddenly, to my great surprise, because it was not planned, there was a naked dancer performing underneath the sculpture. This was one of those special magic moments of spontaneity. He became a good friend of mine, this Japanese gentleman. He was just inspired by the sculpture and felt it was the right thing to do to start to dance underneath it. A collaboration born of pure spontaneity. I was a little nervous for him because I knew there was a risk that this spinning form could wrap right round him, <laughs> cocoon him like a, <laughs> a silk wire string wrapping up a caterpillar or something. But he managed to do a very nice performance uh, without any disaster. <laughs> mm. 
And there, a very blurry picture, but it shows something of that big space that we performed in in Berlin. <coughs> it's an old uh, power station. And now more waveforms. Now I'm developing a more sophisticated palette of ways of controlling it, but always working with the waves. And now beginning to mix in these little round and differently shaped forms, which now you've seen on a very large scale. I have, have made them grow up. But to start with, they were quite small. And these photographs come from an, another exhibition in France this time, uh, in a small city in the north in Brittany. And now we're back in Spain. It was almost exactly the same show. And this show was in Gijon, if I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> in Gijon, I ended up visiting twice. to do two shows in two consecutive years, 2003 and 2004. They liked me so much, they said, please come back. And now I thought, it's time to go back to small again. I must try and do some experimenting. What I'm going to show you next is a little video, and I must apologize, the quality is not good because I forgot to bring the high quality, but I have a, 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 a video of myself experimenting. Let's see if we can get it to work. But still, the pressure is always on. I just can't resist doing big things. So, no sooner I had finished that than they. Still photographs from there. And then I started a big project. Here we are inside a TV studio in Bangkok. Kind of lucky as it turned out, I was in Bangkok at the time. Because I don't think I could have afforded to do this project in Europe to hire a space so large to do my test work. <coughs> I've been commissioned to create a sculpture to fit in a, a gateway in Milan, and the gateway was 15 meters tall. Uh, this studio, luckily, was more or less tall enough that we could realistically build and test the sculpture. Here it's spinning. And here it is now assembled in the gateway in Milan. It's the, it's the Porta Ticinese, if anybody knows Milan.
and it was put, presented as part of Milan Design Week, an annual event where they have mostly designers but some artists as well exhibiting and it's a, a very exciting and interesting week to be in Milan because there are literally hundreds of different things going on uh, and in that particular year, 2006, they decided to feature the gateways of Milan and they invited, I think, eight light artists to come up with different designs for eight of the different gates. And there we see it by night. And now we move to the show I did most recently before, I was last time in Spain. This is setting up in Valencia, in the Sala Papayo. And you can see here the kind of skeletons that uh, you see in action, because this uses some of the similar techniques that I'm using in the big installation abstract cosmology in the Rena Sophia. Those skeletal structures here, like that, that this one piece at the end there is comparably as large as the big pieces now at Rena Sophia. And these are much smaller ones, but they're all made using a similar method of construction with plastic strips that dynamically will form themselves into these elegant shapes. The process of setting up, of course, is never elegant. It's always just a one of hard work and struggle to get ready on time. And now it's complete. The installation was called Timeless Universe. And I'd also chosen the name of the Gate of Time for the previous piece I showed you. And as of this period, this is from the beginning of 2006, I developed a very deep interest in time. And I'd started to think much more seriously again about physics, a subject that I'd never stopped loving. I've always been very fascinated by science. But in the last two years, I started to think about it much more deeply. Uh, and in a few minutes at the end of this lecture, I'm going to actually spend some time discussing physics with you rather than art. So please be patient when it comes to the end. You'll need your intellectual brain at the ready. <laughs> I started to mix mathematical symbols into the, the designs, which are mostly otherwise abstract. Now this is uh, preparing for the Rena Sophia show. This is the, the little spinner sculptures you've seen, the very first pieces you walk in to my area. And this is the wave function. And of course it does look like there are lots of strings there. That's the power of the chromostrobic light to bring out something that's not really there, uh, an optical phenomenon that depends upon our human perceptions to create that experience of the, the volume in space that's really being created only by that single string but lit by the different colors. And this is the, the recreation of that student work which I showed you very early on in the lecture. I call this piece the enigma of light, and so for me also it's kind of a taking off point for thinking about light, but also beginning to think about its physical properties as an enigma. And in the catalogue I've written not so much about my interest in art, but my interest in science. So if you've read the essay I've put in the catalogue, you'll know a little bit about what I'm thinking about with physics again. And here are the big pieces, the abstract cosmology. Okay, now you have to put on your thinking brain. I'm going to first of all very quickly summarize for you, and I hope you can understand some very important ideas that happened during the 20th century about our understanding of time. Our understanding of time was completely revolutionized and it was very early on realized that the conventional notion of time, 
that we all live with and we accept as a reality is not real. Here it is. This is what we all assume is true and would have believed was absolute and unchangeable. If, it, if you look at this, what I'm trying to say is something very simple. The present is like a single line. The only thing that exists is the present. This is our common sense perception. The past is gone. It's not there. It's history. The future has not yet arrived. It not, obviously does not exist. This kind of Cartesian world existed untroubled for thousands of years, I guess, since first man could think about things such, with such abstraction. Until, of course, this famous troublemaker came along, Einstein. Anybody who has studied relativity at all may recognize this strange symbol here. This symbol is very important. It's not just a symbol, it's a diagram that explains how space-time is connected together. For Einstein, these two cones pointing towards each other, they call them light cones, tell us more about the nature of space and time than past, present and future ever can. We can again apply a sort of sense of space and time as we had before in the Newtonian world. And if I imagine myself at this exact point in the center here, these diagonal lines represent the speed of light. If I just stand still and time passes, I would move gently vertically up the screen. But if I'm moving at a speed, I will not move vertically, I will be moving at an angle. I can never move at a steeper angle than the speed of light, because that is the absolute velocity. And the only thing that's absolute at all in relativity is the concept of the speed of light being fixed and unpassable. Over here I've written space, but we can imagine this diagram is sort of three-dimensional, and now we, the space is kind of like a big plane, just like the surface of the Earth. So we, have, we don't have the full four dimensions of space-time, we have one dimension representing time, and two dimensions representing space that are spread out like this. The plane that appears to be the present moment appears to be this disk moving up through the picture, as you can imagine this thing, this whole structure moving forwards. But now here's the trick. Because Einstein said, if I'm moving, and here is the dotted line representing movement, I can choose that coordinate system, my movement, and I can announce, I feel like I'm still. This is still to me. There's no difference from my point of view if I'm moving that way or I'm moving this way. I'm now moving along this line, and this creates a kind of tilted plane. I'm sorry these diagrams are not very clear. I should have spent longer doing it. You now have to imagine the kind of slice through space-time, which is no longer horizontal, like the surface of a flat world, but is tilted slightly. Now, what is that tilt telling us? It's telling us that from my point of view, what I think is the present moment is all these other places on that tilted surface. But if somebody else, still standing still in the first frame of reference, says what they think the present moment is, they have a different surface. The surfaces do not agree. And so we can never come into agreement about what is the present moment. Simultaneity has ceased to exist. This Einstein was very disturbed by when he realized it. It was not an easy thing for him to accept. Today, students of physics are told, just accept it, it's normal. But it bothered him. Because the only way you can explain this consistently is to say that all space and time must coexist. The past is still there somehow. The future is somehow already out there. There's no way to just strip it back to that present moment we once had. It's all present and past and future mixed together. I'm sorry if it's going to get scary with how much I have to say. <laughs> you only need to look at one of these principles. And don't even try and read it just yet. 
quite a number of years after relativity, not till 1940. A brilliant young man, starting out on his career, just beginning his PhD, and for the first time ever, invited to, to give a talk in front of his peers and his teachers and other physics professors, was inspired by his teacher, not just to talk about something small, but to talk about a grand new theory. In his audience, and this just gives you some idea, of obviously he wasn't just any young man, he was in a very special place, was John von Neumann, one of the co-founders of computing, Wolfgang Pauli, one of the co-founders of quantum mechanics, and Albert Einstein. And quite a few other famous names too. I haven't listed them all. The very inexperienced young man was Richard Feynman, uh, possibly the second greatest physicist after Einstein. He put forward an entirely new theory that had three points to it. We'll ignore the first two. We only really need to look at this third one. The fundamental microscopic phenomena in nature are symmetrical with respect to interchange of past and future. Now, of course, this sounds crazy to us. We all know we're going to grow older. If we break an egg, there's no coming back. You can't make the egg unbreak. But at a fundamental level, when you start to look at electrons, at protons, at these little particles that have been fascinating physicists for 100 years, you find that the interactions look exactly the same if you turn the diagram round. You cannot tell which is the past and which is the future. Now the full theory turned out to be slightly wrong. It didn't work out that way. But one of the things Feynman is most famous for ah, come on, is these diagrams. This is called a Feynman diagram. And I'll try and explain how it works. Here we have an electron. And again, we're imagining time moving upwards. It's the normal convention with physics. They always like to have time moving upwards. So even when we've abolished absolute time, we still have some, some sense of time moving. This is an anti-electron, also called a positron. When matter and antimatter meet, they destroy each other. This wiggly line is a gamma ray. It represents a very high energy form of energy, much higher than light, but essentially the same as light. So here we have the electron, the positron, they meet, they become a gamma ray, but the gamma ray is such an incredibly high energy, an instant later it decomposes and it returns to being an electron and a positron. Completely symmetrical. No difference whatsoever. I can flip this round. Feynman also had another insight. Antimatter is matter traveling backwards through time. He therefore put these little arrowheads pointing in the opposite directions. All matter particles are represented as traveling forwards through time, but antimatter particles are represented traveling backwards through time. This is standard, this is built into the standard model of how we understand particle physics. And this is not just a diagram. Behind this diagram lies a complex realm of mathematical calculations. But these diagrams help physicists organize how to do those calculations. The diagrams can get more complex, and of course the calculations are very complex. Now we come to the very near to the present day. About two years ago, I read a, a proposal, let me not call it more than that, by a physicist called John Kramer to create a kind of time machine. Not a time machine for physical objects, but a time machine for information. Here is his plan. Do you want me to try and explain it to you? <laughs> yes? Yes, you're ready for this? <laughs> this is the most complicated bit in the whole talk. <laughs> okay. This is the laser, symbolically, and the laser is entering a special crystal. 
the crystal will split the laser into two beams. When the light is split in this special way, it becomes entangled. It is said that the photons coming out from one side are entangled with the photons on the other side. When you write the mathematics to express how those photons are behaving, you have a single wave function which describes the combined properties of these two beams of light coming out. Some of this light you catch in two fiber optics. You whirl it away, 10 kilometers away. It doesn't really need to be that far, but just for example, he said, let's say, make it go so far. This means it takes quite a bit of time to go that far, about five microseconds, six microseconds. It then arrives up here, I have to use my pointer again, and just comes out close together in two places that form a pattern which students of physics will recognize looks like a double slit. The double slit is one of the great enigmas of physics often discussed. And what has been observed and proved, but nobody is entirely in agreement about why it is, is that there are two circumstances. Here we have a lens, and here we have a detector. If we put the detector here, the lens will help us focus an image so we can actually see which slit the light's coming out of. Under those circumstances, you just see individual photons popping out like little solid particles, so to speak, and they will just appear, blip, 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 one or the other. Here, as you see, a sort of diagram. You would see, this is supposed to be like a graph now, representing, you could either see one slit or the other slit, and they always come out of one or the other distinctly. Now, move our detector in, the slits go out of focus you can no longer tell which direction they traveled. The photons now make a pattern like this. This is called an interference pattern. Only waves can do this. Particles cannot. Depending on how you choose to observe the photons, they magically transform themselves from particles to waves. Kramer's question is, if we do this at the top, as I've just described, what happens to the entangled photons traveling down here? Is it possible that by changing the way we observe these upper photons, we would change the way these photons down beh below behave? Because if is that is what happens, notice this. This is a very short light path, maybe less than one meter. This is a long light path. It's taken, as we say, relatively a long time. But these, particle, these photons here, because they're arriving now about five microseconds before those ones, would have to anticipate and change their behavior before we ever even change the experimental setup there. Design an experiment clever enough that you could move this very fast and we would send information backwards through time. Kramer's time machine. There are problems, which he himself points out, but he doesn't fully answer. But tonight, I can answer those problems, because I've solved them. It's taken me two years of thinking about it. I only found the answer about two months ago, and this is the first time I've presented the answer in public. Here's one of the problems, the bilking paradox. Now suppose that a tricky observer receives a message from himself 50 seconds in the future, but then he decides not to send it. This produces an inconsistent time-like loop jargon. But you can see what's the problem. <laughs> this has become to be known as the bilking paradox. How could this happen? Or if not, what would prevent it? What would prevent the creation of this contradiction? This paradox alone appears to prove that all forms of sending information back through time should be impossible. The next paradox. The other issue raised by vectorcausal signaling might be called the Immaculate Conception Paradox. 
Suppose that you are using the setup described and you receive from yourself in the future the manuscript of a wonderful novel with your name listed as the author. You sell it, publish it, become the bestseller, and you become rich and famous. When the time subsequently comes for transmission, you duly send the manuscript back to yourself, thereby closing the time-like loop and producing a completely consistent set of events. But the question is, who wrote the novel? <laughs> Clearly you did not. You merely passed it to yourself. Yet highly structured information has been created out of nothing. And in this case, nature should not object because there are no inconsistent time-like loops. An even deeper mystery. Now there are a few physicists who believe time travel is possible, not just Kramer, and I'm not sure if he even believes it. But for most physicists, they've argued that the only way that it could be made possible is if there are many worlds exist. The idea that there are many worlds has been explored in science fiction, but also by serious physicists. I myself am a little skeptical, and I don't think we need the complexity of the many worlds. I am happy to think about this one world, but to think about it carefully and to understand how quantum mechanics has not changed our understanding of nature. Here I've put together a very simple diagram. Here we have the future, just with dotted lines, and the present. We're still allowed to talk about future and present, even in this relativistic world. It makes sense. But what we've learned from quantum mechanics is that the future is not always clearly defined. Some things we can be certain about. For example, where will the Earth be tomorrow? This is classical mechanics. If we try to use quantum mechanics to work out the answer, we will come to the same conclusion. It will be in the same place. It will not be spread out by uncertainty. Other things, microscopic things, are spread out by uncertainty. So the important distinction to make when thinking about the future is that the future is not always certain, but there are some things within it which are. Let's try and list a few. Earthquakes. An earthquake is a certain event because it depends upon classical physics. We have no way to predict when they are going to occur at this moment because we do not yet understand geology. But we do understand enough about geology to be certain that quantum mechanics has nothing to do with it whatsoever. These are physical forces on a large scale. And quantum mechanics works almost <coughs> always on a small scale. Volcanoes. Even the weather over maybe not a very long time, but over a period of much longer than weather forecasts are currently possible. These are all deterministic processes. We can therefore define two categories of knowledge, deterministic knowledge and non-deterministic knowledge. If we try and send a message from the future back to ourselves concerning a deterministic piece of information, all the possible states of that instrument will agree, and so a message will arrive loud and clear. If, on the other hand, we try and send ourselves, say, the results of the presidential election coming up in America, this is not deterministic. It could never be sent back. Each time we conduct the experiment, we will get a different answer. The message will be lost in transmission. This is the resolution to those paradoxes. It is possible to build a time machine for transmitting information backwards through time, but we'll never be able to transmit all information back, only deterministic knowledge. It will be of great interest, not only in saving us from natural disasters, but in science, and I dare say in many other cultural <laughs> domains yet to be discovered. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you.
Don't be shy. That's true. In fact, Kramer himself did seek funding for it and was refused it because his colleagues didn't believe it would work. He went out with a begging bowl, so to speak, and has received a very small amount of sponsorship from private individuals, with which he's managed to start but not complete the experiment. The last time he publicly reported on it, about a year back, he said that he still didn't have sufficiently sensitive detectors to be sure of what was happening in the setup. And at this moment, I hope he's still pursuing it and he's still, uh, no doubt, still hunting for more money to buy better equipment, basically. Um, another point about that experiment I was curious about. Um, what if the, I mean, okay, this, this uh, presupposes this idea of a future or a past, but would it the, the short path, the detector on the short path, had just have an impact on the kind of signal you got at the end of the long path? That depends on the design of the experiment, and in principle you can eliminate that impact. The argument is really whether or not there's a connection at all, and the doubting physicists doubt his interpretation of the, of the wave function and question whether in fact there will be that influence present. We don't know, it's a valid experiment to conduct. So. Well, the very important thing to realize with quantum mechanics is that there's a, an agreed set of equations that everybody knows works. But there's no agreed in interpretation of why they work. And it's been long debated. There are a number of different competing ways of trying to understand what goes on. And the standard way is called the Copenhagen interpretation. Essentially sidesteps asking certain kinds of questions and says, it's not valid to ask a question unless you can realistically create an experiment that shows you what's happening. So for that standard way of thinking about things, the process of making the measurement is central. The criticism of that is that obviously most of reality is not a scientific experiment in which measurements are being made, and yet the world goes on. From the other side, various different interpretations have been offered Kramer has his own interpretation. He calls it the transactional interpretation. Feynman developed a very interesting one, which I personally consider to be the best of them all. Uh, but there is no straight answer to that. I can't really tell you. Sorry, I was hogging the microphone. Um, I was curious how accepted this idea of deterministic and non-deterministic knowledge is. Well, that's going to be found out when I'm brave enough to find a publisher who is prepared to publish it. At the moment, you're the only audience who knows about it, plus having spoken to it, a few people, um, just personal acquaintances and friends. Uh, and the reaction is, I think, one of curiosity and caution mixed with a certain amount of skepticism. From a scientific point of view, to establish an idea like this is going to take an awful lot of work. And I know, as an artist, I've not been practicing physics for many decades. It's going to be tough. <laughs> and with the, the line between the two be somewhat blurry, I could kind of imagine situations where lots of these very small, non-deterministic events, uh, because you mentioned it in terms of almost a sense of scale, but you could imagine a series of small, non-deterministic events actually having an effect on something which you would normally intuitively imagine would be a deterministic thing like the creation of a star or something like that, but was actually the result of lots of small... I am, I, my own point of view is I think we should start doing the experiments, because by experimental methods we will find what, where the dividing zone lies. And I think that's the, currently the only way that we can proceed with this. Is that in the first place, we don't even know if Kramer's right. It might be that even though I'm saying it's logically justified what he's doing, that it doesn't work, in which case we have to look for another method. It doesn't rule out creating a time gate, as I call it, but it, until we have an experimental method, I'm skeptical that we can actually 
clearly draw a dividing line between these two areas. But what I'm arguing is that there are two zones that we can say that are well separated and in the middle I, I acknowledge that there's, an, you know, there's a region that will have to be explored. Well, I'm going to move away from physics. Fine. And, <laughs> yes, a little bit hard for me, I'm sure for some of us too. And I want to ask you about the artwork. I'm interested in when you um, said that the uh, that you expect result, results that were harmonic in, in some of the works that you uh, that you like, and it turns out that they were chaotic. And um, I want to ask you how you, uh, you did this process. How did, did, you, did you do an experiment before? Or did you just it was, yes, I have a great belief in experiment in art as well as in science. And I was at the time working on a small scale, making pieces that were literally constructed out of, I uh, had no resources, no funds, made out of cheap odds and ends. And I asked myself a question, would it not be interesting to illuminate a skipping rope, you know, the child's game, with chromoscopic light. <laughs> but rather than skipping, I'm not a very <laughs> athletic person, I thought I'll make a little miniature skipping rope with two model motors. So I took a piece of string about this long and two little toy motors of the sort you could buy in a model shop, powered it up and switched it on, expecting to see this envelope form, but instead held them up and wow, <laughs> just like that, there was just this moment when I saw all these different things happening and so it was a very experimental process of, of discovery and it was one of the great experiments, as I said at the time, great uh, accidental moments of, of, of making a discovery that I was, I had no idea it was there and only later realized chaos theory is out there. There is a theory that explains it. That's why I wanted to ask that. The reason why there is a chaotic um, motion has a, a physics uh, uh, from a physics point of view, has an explanation. It does, yes. Now, if I had got the handheld version of that sculpture with me that you've seen in the installation, you would see that if I pulled the motors apart and stretched them quite tightly, all of the shapes return to the kind of harmonic forms we're familiar with. And as long as you have a good amount of tension on the shape and it can't go off too far to one side or the other, it approximates to a situation in which harmony will always apply. And it's only when you loosen it up and you give it more freedom to move around, at some moment it just jumps away from the harmony and it becomes something much more varied and wild. I don't, time and space, I guess? Words. Words. Well, I have explored at length the idea that time does not exist, because that was the theme of the show I did in 2006 in Valencia. And it's an, an almost inevitable correlate of thinking about that to also contemplate the idea that space does not exist. And this is really at the core of a very abstract mathematical way, from my point of view, of thinking about how reality might be constructed. But I know also when I was doing that show, a lot of people came up to me who were of a, a spiritual or mystical nature and said, yes, this is feels very true to me. And their reason for believing it, I understood to be quite different again because the idea of timelessness is built into an... I don't know. You know, this is the point. I think the point is to keep an open mind at this point. I don't know what's the right way to go next. Well, 
I've always had a kind of sn sneaky suspicion that one, in a sense, was in contact with the future. You know, a personal faith in precognition, if you like. If I have any faith at all, it's that faith. But it's not a well-formed vision of the future necessarily that it comes. It's more like hunches. So I don't really know where they come from at all. I don't know where it's going to go. I have faith, though, that it's going to go somewhere. And so I think that part of the excitement of the creative process is the sense of discovery. That if you had an entirely worked out plan about what was going to happen, because life would then become predictable, it would become boring. And it's because I don't know what's going to happen. I've only got this kind of glimpses of the future, if that's really what's going on. The hints of, you know, maybe some things are determined while other things are not determined. That I'm excited to carry on working. I don't know what my work's going to look like, you know, five, ten years from now. I'll find out.